All right, uh, we are going to go over your assignment from Cyber Patriot Unit Zero, the case studies. We're going to take a look at that today. And while we are working on that, if you have not finished that assignment, feel free to open it up and work on it while we talk about it because I know I kind of just dumped that on you and I didn't really go over it with you very well. So I want to make sure that you understand um, how these case studies work. First of all, we're going to go over the do nots and the do's, the principles of cyber ethics. We talked about them, but not in detail the other day. And I want to go over this with you. Do not use a computer to harm other people. All right. Use them for good, not for evil, please. Do not interfere with other people's computer work. Don't do things to somebody's computer that's going to make it hard for them to work. That includes something as simple as you walking up to somebody who's working on their computer and slamming it shut. Okay, that's interfering with their work. And it's also taking a chance on shattering their screen. Um, don't touch their computer. Uh, don't push other buttons. Things like that. Now, it also includes things like Oh, I don't know, installing a password that shouldn't be there so that they can't get to their work. There's a lot of ways that you can interfere with people's computer work. And that is a do not of cyber ethics. Do not snoop around in other people's computer files. All right. They have some amount of privacy in there. You don't snoop around. Do not use a computer to steal. That's pretty, that's pretty straightforward. Do not use a computer to bear false witness. Bear false witness means to lie. We don't use computers to lie and to make people look bad. Do not copy or use proprietary software for which you have not paid. We'll talk more about intellectual property later on, but if you're trying to use a program and it tells you that you have to install it and pay for it and all that kind of stuff before you can use it, do that because that's somebody's living. That's somebody's wages. They, they created this thing, and this thing is something that they use to take care of their family. Do not use other people's computer resources without authorization or proper compensation. That means if you're going to use somebody else's computer um, programs or whatever, make sure they say it's okay. I need you to sit up, sir, and you take your hood off in the room. Thank you. Get your laptop out. All right, you need to look on with someone who does then. Um, again, uh, don't use other people's computer resources. You must have authorization and you must compensate them for that. Do not appropriate other people's intellectual output. Again, we will talk more about intellectual property at another time. Do think about the social consequences of the program you're writing or the system you are designing. If you are creating things on a computer, you need to make sure that you are creating things that are actually going to help people, not harm people. Think about all the ways that thing that you're creating could be used. Are there harmful ways that it could be used and how could you stop that from happening? Do always use a computer in ways that ensure consideration and respect for your fellow humans. All right, uh, consideration, respect. We, we are all humans. Uh, we need to respect one another. And you can make sure that you use your computer, your social media, things like that in ways that show respect. Now, do you have to always agree with everyone else? Yes, no, 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 you don't always have to agree. But you don't have to agree with someone to be respectful. You don't have to agree with someone to be kind. There are lots of adults that need to learn this. So I'm hoping that you learn it early. All right, let's move on here. Um, we're going to talk about this first case study, the Terry Child study. And I'm going to read it out loud to you. 
Um, I put it in words in the thing, but I'm going to just read it out loud to you. Terry Childs was a 43-year-old network engineer for the city of San Francisco. He worked on our fiber optic network called FiberOne, which handled crucial government data, such as email, legal documents, and payroll. So all of those things are things that should be pretty secure because they are emails, private conversations, legal documents, and payroll that affects people's money. By most accounts, he was a diligent and talented employee, and he seemed dedicated to making sure our systems ran safely. Childs spent hours trying to perfect our fiber one system, upgrading equipment, and installing firewalls. He's, he did the cyber security things that you're going to be learning about. In the summer of 2008, Childs was reassigned, and when he was instructed to hand over the password he had created for FiberOne, he refused. He had created a password for this whole system, and he refused to give it to them. He was given a different job. He was reassigned. He wasn't even fired. He was just reassigned but he refused to give over the password. So what's he done right there? What has he violated right there? Okay, did he interfere with people's computer work? Okay, did he harm other people because they couldn't take care of payroll, right? Okay, so there's two things that he violated right there. No one could get into the fiber one without that password. Emails were inaccessible. Payroll couldn't go out and documents were under virtual lock and key. The city was in crisis. We had to have that code. We spent at least $1 million, including hiring a team at Cisco Systems to crack the code, but they couldn't do it. So they also lost a lot of money. We had no choice but to try to compel him to give up the password. So the police arrested Childs on a charge of felony computer tampering and put him in jail. But he still wouldn't give up the code. I was as honest as I could be asking him to give me the code as a favor, if nothing else. And he responded. Childs said he didn't trust his bosses or colleagues, but at that moment he trusted me. He wrote down the code, all 28 numbers and letters of it, and handed it over. Now, he had already held the city hostage because they couldn't get to their documents and their emails and they couldn't pay people. And they spent a million dollars trying to fix it. So should he have been arrested? Do you think he should have been arrested? Did he tamper with the computers? Did he violate cyber ethics? Yes, he did. Which principles? We talked about that a little bit. We said what? He harmed other people. And... He interfered with their work. Were there any of the others up there that he violated? Do what? Um, how was it a good cause to not let people get paid? It doesn't matter whether he trusted his boss or not because at that moment he had been reassigned to a different job. Again, he wasn't fired. He was reassigned. He was moved. So it's not like they were out to get him. All right, let's see. It says, Terry Childs violated several U.S. laws and was found guilty of those violations by a jury. That being said, there has been strong debate about what should have happened. This is a, only a point of discussion, not as the prompt for a legal debate. Um, he could arguably be accused of violating a number of cyber ethics principles, but the one that most closely matches is do not interfere with other people's computer work. All right. Now, if you have not done that part of the case study, you need to write that up. Um, I'm not going to stop the video right now. We're going to move on. But if you want to go back to this later and you want to write it up later, you can do so. All right. Desmond Haig, the CEO of Centerplate, a catering company that serves food at sports stadiums around the country, was caught on camera kicking a dog in a Vancouver elevator. After issuing a public apology, Haig agreed to attend anger management counseling, serve a thousand hours of community service, and donate $100,000 of his own money to an animal charity. 
Less than a week later, he was forced to resign. Why do you think they forced him to resign? What did he, did it damage the image of the company? I mean, him kicking a dog? Yeah. From all other metrics, Mr. Haig was a good CEO. His company grew and profited while he was in charge. So he was a good boss, but he did make a mistake. He kicked a dog and it got caught on camera. Now, do you think that he should have been forced to resign? Now, I, I love dogs. I love dogs a lot. And no, he shouldn't have kicked the dog. But these were some of the other things that he did. Um, he agreed to, he issued a public apology. He agreed to attend anger management and served a thousand hours of community service and donated a hundred thousand dollars of his money to an animal charity. So do you think he should have also been forced to resign? Now, again, I love dogs and I hate that he kicked the dog. That bothers me. But should one mistake define him for the rest of his life? Let's see what they say. It says ethics in the real world can sometimes look very different. He might have assumed that no one was watching since he was alone. He was in the elevator of his own home and wasn't working. So what does this say about how ethics work in real life? Was he at work when this happened? Had nothing to do with his job, right? It was a home thing. So in our world where we have everybody watching us, ethics are different because they're going to look at us even when we're at home. Yeah. It was not his dog. Now, what are some reasons he might have kicked it? Do you think the dog might have, met, he could have been trying to defend himself. It doesn't say that. It just says he kicked it. But we never know. We don't know the whole story if we're not there. Now, granted, I don't agree with kicking a dog. I, it, okay, in, I'm guessing he lived in a big city and probably in a tall building. So there was an elevator in his building where he lived. So, all right. As was discussed earlier, laws are one of the things that help inform ethics. They are not by themselves what ethics is about. There is no law that says you can't kick a dog. Now, you kick it harshly and over and over again, yeah, that's animal cruelty. But there's no law that says you can't brush it away. All right. In this case, the actions of Mr. Haig were questionable, but probably not to the point of being illegal. However, it's very clear that what he did was unethical. It wasn't illegal, but it definitely wasn't right. Sit down. Sit down. Take the pass. All right. The example embodies the difference between moral agents and moral patients or subjects of moral worth. Now, these are some important definitions here. A moral agent is someone who has the power to intentionally cause harm. He was more powerful than the dog. He had the power to cause harm. A subject of moral worth is someone or something that is vulnerable, children and pets, for example. Okay, a moral agent could cause harm to su a subject of moral worth. We expect moral agents to do everything in their power to protect subjects of moral worth, and we punish moral agents more harshly when they cause harm to the subjects of moral worth. All right, so this full grown man harming a dog or an adult harming a child, okay, you see. This is where the ethical part comes in. Now, a child being harmed, that is definitely illegal. But a pet was different. All right, make sure that you write this one up as well. All right, the last one. This is a really good one. Mr. Autry was waiting for the subway in Manhattan with his two daughters. Nearby, a man collapsed with a seizure. Mr. Autry and two women rushed to help. The man managed to get up, but then stumbled and fell onto the tracks. In an instant, Mr. Autry jumped onto the tracks. 
Mr. Autry pressed himself and the man into the space between the tracks. It gave them just enough room to avoid being hit by the train. Five train cars rolled past before the train finally came to a stop. Both men were relatively unharmed. All right, so this guy jumped on a train track to help someone else. Could we have done the same thing? Would you have put your life in danger to help someone else? No. That's a hard thing. That's a very hard thing. Now, this man undoubtedly felt like he was capable of doing this, and he felt like he was strong enough that he could do this. If I'm being totally honest, there is probably no way I would do it because I would be more fearful of causing more of a problem than the guy being able to get out of the way on his own. Because I know I wouldn't be as fast and I wouldn't be as strong. I would want to, and we want to say that we would do those things, but would we? You know, that's a tough decision. And you know what? You may not know the answer to that until you would actually be faced with something like that. Our survival instincts would kick in, but also our human instinct would kick in that we want to help someone. Uh, this is a question that we all need to ask ourselves. We would like to think that in life or death situations, we would make the right choice. But if we don't practice in our everyday situations, how can we expect to be prepared? If you don't do the right thing when it's simple, how are you going to do the right thing when it's hard? That's hard, huh? You got to think about that. Uh, students can begin acting ethically today. You don't have to wait for an extraordinary event to be an everyday hero. I like that. You don't have to wait for an extraordinary event to be an everyday hero. You can, oh, I don't know. We get new kids in here all the time. You could smile at someone and help them find a class and you could be their hero for the day. And that's pretty simple to do. You could have your charger with you and see that someone is struggling and offer to let them use your charger and you could be their hero for the day. There's all kinds of ways you could do it. Uh, you could do something as simple as be kind to someone who's looking like they're having a rough day. You know what? You could be a hero to a little brother or sister by reading them a story. They just want your time. They just want you to act like you care about them and you read them a story. Oh my goodness. Or play a game with them. There's lots of ways that you can be an everyday hero. You don't have to jump on a train track. All right. Uh, make sure that you write up all three of those case studies. I'm going to go ahead and uh, minimize this. Are there any questions about the case studies? All right, if you have not finished them, make sure that you take care of them today. Write them up because I am grading things. The other things that you need to finish are, let's go here. Make sure that you come, uh, you can't do the cyberbullying survey yet. It's still blocked. But you can do the chapter three key terms, notes, and text, the chapter three activity one, the chapter three quiz, and make sure you have finished these case studies. That's Cyber Patriot Unit Zero case studies. Are there any questions before I stop this recording? Yeah. Okay, this is computer science, but it covers some of the same topics as cybersecurity. Right now, you guys are, both classes are covering the same types of topics. We will branch off and do different things later on, but right now there are foundations and basics that we have to cover in both. All right, um, if there are no other questions, I'm gonna stop the recording.